Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth in the series of talks, virtual talks, that are run by the Oxford Martin School, which are called Building Back Better, Lessons and Opportunities from COVID-19, from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, preparing for the future. Uh, I should tell you that this talk is recorded and that um, we are very much hope that you will ask questions. To do that, you have to be on um, Crowdcast. And if you are on Crowdcast, down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a uh, button saying, ask a question. And so please do uh, ask a question. And there is also the facility to vote on which questions that you uh, want me to ask. Um, and um, my name is Charles Godfrey. I am the director of the Oxford Martin School. The Oxford Martin School is part of the university. We're a group that has been very generously uh, funded by the Martin family. And our brief is to do work addressing major challenges of the 21st century, work that is nearly always interdisciplinary and cuts across different uh, fields. Uh, I'm really delighted this afternoon to have joining me uh, a colleague and an old friend, um, E.J. Milnagallen, uh, Eleanor Jane Milnagallen, but everyone calls her E.J. And E.J. is a Tassel Aventus Professor of Biology here at the University of, of Oxford. Um, E.J. was actually an undergraduate here and then went to Imperial College where she did a PhD with John Beddington and then moved to Warwick, where, which was her first academic appointment, then to Imperial College and then came back to Oxford about six years ago. And E.J. does extraordinary work uh, on the edge of biology, uh, economics, social science, but all around conservation biology. Um, E.J., I was going to ask you to say a little bit about the work on your lab. Much better for you to describe your work than for me to. What's going on yes. in your lab at the moment? Well, thank you for having me, Charles, and I've been looking forward to this talk for a while. Um, so I guess the, the link with the Oxford Martin School is that we have a big programme on the illegal wildlife trade and on the um, behaviour of consumers and how you can kind of change the supply chain so it becomes more sustainable. But um, that's kind of one aspect of the work that we do, which is broadly around how people relate to nature. A lot of what we do is about individual resource users, often in developing countries who are relating to, to wildlife in various ways. But um, we also try to help conservation organisations design, implement and monitor their programmes better. And recently we've been starting to work a little bit more with government and with business as well. Thanks so much. Now we're going to be talking about lessons for the pandemic for conservation biology and the, re the relationships between humanity and biodiversity and wildlife. Just before we, want, but before we do that, um, we both wanted to mark a very sad event. Um, Dame Georgina Mace, Georgina Mace died at the weekend. Uh, Georgina Mace, many of you will know of her. She is one of the most esteemed and best regarded conservation biologists in the world. She's had an enormous influence on the subject and on ecology and, and uh, population biology. She's known for many things. For example, she was instrumental in developing the IUCN red list criteria, which are just now used uh, throughout the world. She was closely involved in the UK's millennial, uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. She sits at the moment or has sat at the moment on the uh, Climate Change Committee Adaptation Committee. And beyond her work in conservation biology, she was just a, a wonderful ambassador for the subject. She was an ambassador for women in science. She's ambassador for young people. Um, EJ, you knew Georgina very well. You've published many papers with her. Tell me a bit about how you will remember her. Well, I think, you know, when you look at the towering achievements and the awards and the papers and all the... Um, amazing work that she's done. Actually, for many of us, and when I've been monitoring the kind of social media about her, what many, many people say is, um, she changed my career, she touched my life. I only met her twice, but she was so kind, she was so thoughtful, and she really uh, gave a steer into how, um, how to move forward. And I, I completely see that. And I think she, she gave a really good example of how you can be a leader and how you can be someone who's very sharp who always, um, you know, cuts straight to the point in a very incisive way, but is also kind. Uh, 
and um, I felt, you know, really honoured that uh, very early in my career, Georgina did that for me. She showed me how to how to be a leader, and she um, she was always there as a mentor for me and for thousands of other people. I don't know how she did it really. Uh, it, it struck me exactly the same thing. Just in the email traffic, the uh, social media traffic in the last couple of days. It's always sad when a figure as uh, eminent as her uh, dies, but the real love and affection for Georgina that, that has been so palpable, uh, she will be much missed. Yeah. Um, EJ, you, you've talked for a long time now about the possibility of diseases jumping from wildlife into humans and the importance of understanding them in, in wildlife, the importance of understanding the habitats from which they have come. Um, should we have been surprised? Should we have been better prepared for a coronavirus to jump probably from bats, perhaps through something else uh, into humans? Um, should it have taken us as unaware as it seems to have? <laughs> That's a leading question, isn't it? <laughs> of course <laughs> we should have known. Um, and it's not like we haven't had previous um, instances of this so even with coronaviruses so there's SARS but there's also MERS another respiratory syndrome another another coronavirus which went um so SARS through civets probably and then MERS um through bats to camels to humans probably um but it's not just those coronaviruses so we've had a number of of pandemics that have come through that haven't haven't reached the stage of COVID but have have um given the world a shock there's been a number of flus, there's um, Ebola, various other things, Nipah. Um, so it's not like we weren't warned, but I guess previously they've been contained, containable, and therefore we haven't really acted. We haven't really taken the lessons on board. Um, and let's hope we will this time. If you look at many countries in Southeast Asia, then, uh, and you look at what's on the statute books, then it appears really quite impressive. There's a lot of laws out there which protects humans from um, diseases that might jump across. Is the issue that, that it's the implementation of the laws or do we need better laws to, to uh, um, stop, this, stop the emergence of these diseases and their transfer to humans? Definitely there's a need for implementation. Um, and as you say, most countries around the world have quite relatively strong wildlife protection laws. Um, and I think, you know, as a result of COVID, there's going to be more stringent legislation and, and maybe more stringent enforcement as well. But the problem is um, that sometimes that stringent legislation can be, um, you know, a hammer to crack a nut or it can be uh, misaligned and have loopholes. And so, for example, some of the legislation that's been put in in China in response to COVID has um, targeted captive wild animals, um, which perhaps are, are less of an issue with public health and perhaps less an issue with conservation as well, but then has left loopholes with respect to things like um, any aquatic species, which includes things like turtles, which are very widely sold. And um, so, you know, those kinds of issues mean that um, just enforcing laws is great, it has to be done first, and set, but setting in place laws that have these kinds of unintended consequences are also not going to help. So one of the issues seems to have been with um, the current outbreak, uh, the issue of wet markets. Mm. And of course, wet markets have a cultural significance in many countries in Southeast Asia. Well um throughout uh, throughout the world um as someone who thinks as much about the social science as mm. the sort of biology of it are you optimistic that it might be possible to curb infections coming across through consumption of bush meat consumption of wildlife sold through wet markets yeah um well i think first of all we have to be careful not to generalize because as you say there are markets all over the world and um a wet market really is just a name for a food market, a fresh produce market, and some of them have lots of wildlife and some of them don't. And um, I think when we're thinking about markets, we need to think about the fact that we've got three 
uh, maybe four priorities that we need to think that we need to optimize against and it's always difficult to optimize against four different things at once um so we're trying to optimize for public health also for conservation also for animal welfare and also for food security and when we think in that that kind of four-way terms then you can start to think about okay so so for public health there's specific species that are more likely to potentially transmit viruses. There's also an intersection between public health and animal welfare because animals that are more stressed are more likely to shed virus. Animals that are crowded together from different parts of the world, different species are more likely to, to allow the jumping of the species barrier. Um, but then it becomes more complicated when we think about conservation and um, food security because, for example, you know, maybe up to a billion people are dependent on bushmeat either for uh, for their income, for their subsistence, um, and bushmeat trade, local trade. Um, and so just shutting the bushmeat markets is really not necessarily going to be the way forward against any of those four um, priorities. So, so ideally, what would you do then with bushmark and uh, bushmeat and things? Is the idea to um, facilitate a safer alternative form of proteins? And I'm thinking in particular about some of the interesting initiatives in West Africa to mm. um, to um, use some quite novel ideas, for example, using insects to produce mm. protein that then can be fed to chickens and things to provide uh, safer and more secure means of protein for for people who, who really are protein starved. Yeah, and I guess there's a couple of things to think about with that. Um, the first thing is that um, there are laws to be enforced that need to be enforced for protected species. So we shouldn't be trading in highly protected species. Um, but for the commoner species, maybe grass cutters, some of the dikers, um, bushmeat trade is not necessarily one of the major risks. Maybe habitat loss is, is even more of a risk. And um, we can't go against people's uh, lived experience and we can't introduce things that people don't want to do so you could just imagine the same what what reaction we would have in this country if someone came in and said oh well you know you can't you can't sell beef anymore and you've got to eat insects instead um, for no obvious reason and say oh well it's to do with uh, disease risk um, if there's no evidence in your daily life that that's true so you have to kind of work with people and understand what people actually are prepared to accept and work with people about what their own preferences are. So for example, fish is often quite preferred in many parts of the world and, and you know, moving towards a sustainable fishery would help. But uh, there's a nice example from Guinea from the uh, 2013 to 16 Ebola outbreak, which is kind of instructive, which is that um, one of the main outbreak areas is quite close to protected area. And it, it is true that probably Ebola came through butchery of a primate or something um, that someone had hunted but by the time the ebola was actually at kind of epidemic levels transmission was human to human it was bushmeat wasn't anything to do with it um what, people put up public health messaging that was very strongly about do not eat bushmeat um and the local people thought well a you know we've been eating bushmeat for a long time and it hasn't caused a problem. B, we don't trust this public health messaging now because we think there's a there's a hidden agenda here. It's about trying to stop us going to protected areas to get bushmeat. Um, and I think there probably was. And so actually the entire public health messaging failed because people just dismissed it as these are external people coming in with hidden agendas. And it actually backfired in terms of getting people to do the safe things that needed to be done for Ebola. So I think that's a nice example of where not considering those social elements just leads you into worse situations. And can you give an example from, from your work either in Africa or in Asia of a good example of where there has been a beneficial intervention that has both reduced the effect of, uh, of for example, bushmeat hunting and reduce the probability of a disease jumping the species barrier. Is there well, some good? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So not, not not focused on disease particularly, but we've got a project with IIED and um, some Cameroonian um, in-country NGO partners, which is called Why Eat Wild Meat. And mm -hmm. the reason why it's called that is that um, alter alternative livelihood projects, alternative protein source projects, are endlessly being um, implemented um, across sub-Saharan Africa and often they fail 
And that often is because the real reasons why people are or are not eating different protein sources are not investigated. The alternatives are not co-designed with local people and the actual constraints are not addressed. So, for example, our researchers have found that um, the reasons why people aren't actually able to make a living from the sustainable aquaculture that has been introduced around the Jar Reserve is because um, when they go into town, they get um, they have to pay a tax to the eco guards. They can't get permits to sell their fish, which they had before to sell their bush meat. Um, therefore, you know, because of all the kind of it, rent capture by um, corrupt elements or the kind of costs of actually doing business, it ends up that it costs them more to sell the fish than than they would have made for it. So that's an example where, unless you talk to local people, you don't get that kind of um, insight. So that's fascinating because there's always been a paradox that uh, aquaculture, which has been so successful in Southern Asia, has proven so hard to take off in, in Africa. And from what you're saying, that sounds like it could very well be that the lo local social and economic context is just not looked at properly. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the IIED and many people know what that is. But to, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the International Institute for Environment and Development, a really fascinating yeah. NGO based in, in London. Um, we, we started by remembering the wonderful Georgina Mace, and one of the things that Georgina has um, been instrumental for has been talking about, uh, and with many other people, about the importance of biodiversity. Um, biodiversity is a form of natural capital. Quite how much that we as humanity gain from the natural world, which is just not accounted for in the way we normally think of uh, um, uh think about what are our, our assets. And so the uh, natural capital is an overlooked uh, uh, asset. And so we, we talk so much about ecosystem services and classic examples is that crops that are pollinated by wild bees and things. Um, I wonder if one of the things that may come out of thinking about the pandemic is actually thinking about ecosystem disservices so if one, um, I, and I speak as someone who spent three months in my youth catching bats in Africa, and I, I love bats, uh, and I worry that uh, if people realise that bats, for complicated reasons that we could happily chat about, are a reservoir for so many viruses which can potentially hop over into humans, that then bats may be seen as a bad part of nature, and we will go about destroying them and a priori that doesn't seem a silly thing to do so do you worry about that one legacy of the pandemic is that we will view parts of the natural world as potentially very harmful and that that this will cause conservation uh, uh conservation biology issues yeah and we've seen it before actually so um i work a lot in southern russia and during the last bird flu pandemic, there was a, a call out to cull all, all migratory water birds as they were flying around um, the Caspian Sea into, into southern Russia from the government and from local hunting organisations. So um, that's, yeah, that's not very helpful. Also, in SARS, there was a kind of general, let's go and kill all the civets <laughs> view. So I, I don't think it's at all unlikely that people will go out and look at fruit bat, bat roots and, roosts and try and um, destroy them i think what we have to do is view nature in the round so <laughs> nature is its own thing it's not there to provide services or disservices to us um, it does have it does make contributions to people and those contributions are of varied and complex kinds so for example with bats fruit bats in particular major pollinators of many important crops um, and so you know you want to have bats around your area but what you don't want to do is to um to encroach on their habitat to the extent to which you're disturbing roosts and you're getting too close to them. So, um, for example, Nipah virus, there's quite good evidence in, that in Malaysia, they, it was um, transmitted through pigs to humans, um, starting from bats. And that was because of uh, recent encroachment into forest areas, which then disturbed the bats, which then made degraded habitat. The bats moved closer to the pigs, the pigs then um, um, so I think it, we need to reevaluate our own relationship to nature and try to think about ways that we can live more, that sounds a bit trite, but, you know, live more harmoniously with nature. And some of that is about not 
continually encroaching on the forest frontier, um, thereby exposing ourselves to these issues. So, so as you know, that there has been a debate which uh, can sometimes get acrimonious in the conservation biology community about people who argue that we should view nature, that, that the reason to preserve nature is that we have a duty of stewardship for the natural world and others who, um, and caricaturing two ends of a spectrum and others who take a purely instrumental approach that we should uh, take an economic valuation. And again, going back to Georgina, Georgina was one of the people sort of pour, poured oil on this troubled water. Do you think that, that, that post pandemic that will affect that debate that that if i might interpret what you've said in sort of looking more holistically about nature that it is acknowledging the good that it does but also taking account of a stewardship function that that we we in a sense have a duty to preserve biodiversity for future generations do you think the pandemic will alter the dynamics of that of that discussion well, I sort of hope so. <laughs> I think um, where we are with the pandemic is um, a hideous and horrible situation, which is also providing a massive shock to our economic and social system. And that massive shock is perhaps um, coming at a time which is when we're in the last chance saloon. So we have an opportunity to actually uh, move towards some of the sustainable scenarios that um, have been put forward by scientists, including by Georgina in a paper that was published just 10 days before she died, um, that show that if we have conservation, if we if we do change our, soci our societal um, approach, then we can actually move to a situation where we live sustainably with nature. So, you know, it's kind of a, we're in a situation where climate change effects, the effects of biodiversity loss are becoming just monstrously apparent around the world. And and we have this pandemic that will necessarily need lead to re-evaluation of our economies. But I think it's going to vary very much where we are. So in the countries of Western Europe, you know, what we need to think about is our own supply chains, our own footprint overseas and the huge damage we do without even realising that that's what we're doing in our general consumption. Um, in other places like in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there's going to be shocks that are much more kind of coming through the macroeconomic system um, through their global trade networks, for example. So, so, so moving on to some of the indirect effects of the pandemic, um, of course, there are many fabulous conservation initiatives throughout the world, and thinking particularly of sub-Saharan Africa, where um, the viability of conservation projects um, absolutely depends on ecotourism. And the one thing that just hasn't happened this year is much tourism. And it's um, going to take several years for tourism to, to recover. Um, from discussions that I'm sure you have with other conservation biologists, how worried are people really about short-term effects on endangered species uh, in, um, at the moment as ecotourism has been so curtailed? Yeah, worried. I mean... <laughs> So it's the general flows of money to conservation um, and the fact that, like I said, there's there's incentives for um, negative interactions with nature. So the fact that as people look away, it's possible for illegal logging to continue and even for um, and, and accelerate and even for governments to actually um, tacitly or not endorse land grabs. Um, endorse or at least not stop um, endangered species exploitation and so we're in a dangerous situation where the environmental laws are not being um, enforced or, or actually being weakened at a time where the flows of money through conservation are pretty much drying up um, and that just speaks to the need to have a more sustainable economy in these places. So we need to have an economy which is diversified, it's just like the rural countryside in, in the UK. You know, you need a diversified economy in which people aren't reliant on just one source of income, in which people can meet the aspirations that they have for, you know, perhaps a more connected world where they can get their education, where they can actually fulfill their potential in those rural areas. And actually people 
in the best situations around national parks, it's not about emptying the place of people. It's about enabling people to live decent lives and actually act as a buffer to external encroachment often. And so supporting, you know, indigenous people's rights, um, land rights, land tenure rights, enabling mobile connection, enabling kind of basic utilities can actually be a, a good thing for conservation. The most extraordinary thing that I've noticed in sort of visiting Africa for 30 years is how um, Africa has leapfrogged uh, in some technology. And of course, mobile phones is, mm. is the, uh, uh, it's the most characteristic one. And for a long period, I could get a better mobile phone signal in my field site in rural Kenya than I could where I live 20 miles south of, of, um, uh, of uh, Oxford. Um, are you optimistic about um, rural development in uh, in Africa, doing exactly what you're saying, trying to bring people out, out of poverty? S certainly seems to me extremely patchy that in some areas one is seeing this and a rapid sort of increase in uh, local incomes. And in other areas, um, even though there are mobile phones everywhere and even though, uh, and even though other good things are happening, then it just seems impossible for the vast majority of people to move out of poverty. Yeah, and you, you know, you stray away from conservation then into the whole thing about um, political economy and power and um, the reluctance of governments to decentralise, um, when what we really need, I think, in these places, just as you say, is, is kind of decentralisation so you can have mobile networks, you can have locally um, locally sourced power, those kinds of things. And actually, you know, I think we're starting to realise, um, both within conservation and within development and in the kind of rights-based approach to, to um, human development, that there's so much common ground between conservation and um, some of the more kind of people orientated areas that we're thinking about the same thing. So if you want to have a sustainable relationship with the planet, you do actually have to have people who are have a decent standard of living, who have rights, um, who are able to make a living. And I think, you know, we don't need to continually uh, convert natural areas anymore. We can intensify in a way that's sustainable. We can use precision agriculture and we can do that in a way that's fair. Um, and again, it's just about the power, the willpower to, to invest in that. So that's a view I strongly agree with and sustainable intensification. So you're trying to increase the productivity of land with reduced effects on the environment simply to give the space so you don't have to convert e convert everything. But um, even that is really quite controversial. There are many people who find that as um, I guess the word intensification has so many negative connotations. Um, how do you how do you argue that something like with as a motive description as intensification can actually be good for conservation? Well, I think if conservation is going to succeed, I guess I guess you know the WWF triple challenge is, is the way we need to think about it. Is that we're going to have nine billion people on the planet? We're going to have to feed them. Uh, we need to curb climate change and we need to have a natural system that is not completely broken so that we can actually survive on the planet. So how do you how do you reconcile those three imperatives that we can't get around? And the only way to reconcile those three imperatives is some form of sustainable intensification. I think maybe if people have an old fashioned view of what intensification means. It doesn't necessarily mean sticking a load of pesticides on the ground and degrading our soils. I think what you're talking about, what I'm talking about is sustainable intensification where you actually build up soil structure, you you kind of deploy natural weapons that we have and you actually work in a smart way, you know, smart irrigation so that you're wasting less water, um, locally appropriate forms of compost, that kind of thing. But it, it is quite a challenge for some of the NGOs in this area. I, I should say, I know you're on the board of uh, World Wildlife, um, WWF, um, UK on this and WWF and some of the other organizations such as that Nature Conservancy then they really have embraced this agenda of you can't think of conservation in isolation you have to think of it simultaneously with agricultural policy with rural economic policy uh, for some of the other deeper green NGOs it's much more challenging to do that um, how do you think that 
the sort of center of gravity within the conservation NGO community is going to evolve in the in the coming in the coming years. Do you think there will be um, an increasing realization of this holistic approach to the environment, or will it sort of um, sharpen to the di dichotomy that we see, for example, in the, in the states between environmentalists and non-environmentalists? I think we're in a really worrying time within conservation, actually. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's a pragmatic conservationist, and I guess I would class myself as one of those that, you know, I'm, I'm, I have an end goal, and I think we all have a similar end goal within conservation, and I'm, I'm prepared to do whatever um, makes sense to get to that end goal. Um, but then there's a perfectly valid moral standpoint that just says from a moral perspective as you say we we have to be stewards of nature we shouldn't be um killing individual animals we shouldn't be um messing with nature um but you know i think it's very easy to take a standpoint like that when you're sitting in a developed economy um but i am not necessarily convinced that everyone thinks through the kind of practical implications of taking that kind of standpoint um, in the world in which we live. And um, I really hope that in conservation we are able to, to reconcile those two points of view and try to think about what kind of a world humanity needs in order to, to persist in a comfortable way, which will include nature conservation at much larger level than it is at the moment. Um, but I worry that we're distracting ourselves by tearing ourselves apart with these kind of um, rather sterile debates about things that um, in the end aren't really getting to the nub of the issue, which is overconsumption and, um, you know, continued living beyond our means. Um, we have five questions which have come up and I'm going to come on to questions. Uh, there's one thing I want to ask EJ before we move on to questions. So please can I encourage people both to ask questions and if there are questions there already that you particularly like then uh, then do uh, vote which will make it easier for me to uh, uh, to choose the ones to ask first. Um, EJ I, I wanted to sort of finish by asking a more parochial question about conservation in the UK at the moment so um, we've come out of the European community um, which means that we've come out of the common agricultural policy um, um, which means that we have to well we have to find a different way of supporting our rural economies so at the moment we put large amounts of money into agriculture because we have to because in the absence of that money going in then a large fraction of agricultural businesses would uh, essentially go to the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but the government has committed to change the way that that money is allocated. So at the moment, it largely goes through the single farm payment, which is based on acreage with some complexities around it. And they have committed to moving not immediately, but uh, over a number of years to what is called public money for public good. And if you take um, public good in the technical economic sense, then many of the public goods that will be supported are environmental public goods and biodiversity and conservation. Um, are you optimistic about um, the way the argument, the political um, discussion around conservation is moving in the UK? What would you like, what would you, if, if you were up there in cabinet, what would you be arguing for at the moment? Well, I'm, I'm pretty positive about the agriculture bill and the environment bill um, and about the commitment to moving towards um, public money for public goods. I think that is the right way to go. It's going to be difficult, but um, it's a transition we're going to have to make. Um, I guess one thing is that we do have the Lawton Report from 10 years ago, which was a really influential piece of work, uh, which um, was commissioned to say how would we be able to restore nature um, within this country and um, came up with some excellent suggestions and that needs to be implemented it's been there uh, 10 years and I think there's a chance now to implement that and I think the um, lots of the local NGOs in the UK you know the Wildlife Trust for example are really pushing for 
connectivity and trying to make sure that as we restore nature, we restore it in a, in a smart way, as suggested by the Lawton report, that has more connection, um, you know, as well as better managed and um, the larger, higher quality nature. So, 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 so just to remind people who, who are not familiar with it, then, and correct me again if I get it wrong, so what Lawton recommended was that there should be uh, money put into um, environments or sort of landscapes which allow different elements of the landscapes to be connected together to improve the um the capacity for it to support biodiversity and i think that they funded a number of pilot schemes mm -hmm. um and your argument is that was good but more needs to be done well i don't think they've actually you know the law report hasn't fully been implemented there were the pilot schemes but i think in combination with um, the changes to agriculture what we need to do is be a little bit more smart about our spatial planning so in this you know if you think of a country like south africa they have really strong spatial planning in which they've done a kind of thorough map at the kind of governmental level and then provincial level of where the critical biodiversity habitat is where the um the areas that are more important but but potentially uh, replaceable are, and then the areas which are kind of okay for development. And they've got a plan for where they want, what they want their countryside to look like um, in 10, 20 years time, and they're moving towards that plan. And that allows you to have joined up development as well, because, you know, there does need to be some more development. Um, and it's crucial that it gets placed in the right places. And that when we talk about the kind of jargon of biodiversity net gain we do it in a way that means that at the landscape scale we are restoring nature um and so the lawton report is is the kind of from the biological you know this is what biologists would want if you genuinely wanted to leave your countryside in a better state than it um than it is now and it's kind of based on ecological principles but then you have the other side of the of the coin which is about okay what do we actually need in order to grow the food that we need in order to to build the houses that people need so how can we how can we kind of integrate all of that into a spatial plan so i think i think there's a little bit more thinking that needs to be done um, to make sure that the sectors are joined up so that you're not just um, focusing on farmland on one side and biodiversity on the other side in the environment act so the british government has recently argued that it needs to change the planning regulation uh, to make uh, development easier in some areas and they would argue um, harder in uh, in other areas so more granular changes rather than the same rules uh, throughout and that's been roundly criticized by i think many environmental organizations but uh am i right in interpreting in what you've said that were that to be applied well so that um there was net gain it, it is not a stupid way of thinking about the future of planning so special you know, joined up spatial planning at the landscape scale is 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 sensible. You know, <laughs> and it's something. For example, TNC has been pushing a lot in their kind of um, when you're trying to to um, make sure that local priorities and local needs are integrated within biodiversity conservation. But the the underlined word there is local, and I think a lot of the pushback against what's been announced is is that lack of localism and and you know if, if biodiversity is anything it's something that that and the reason why biodiversity is so hard to measure and the reason why we haven't got um towards the same kinds of metrics as climate change is that biodiversity is complicated and it's local and that it, it you know the interactions between different elements of biodiversity happen at a range of different spatial and temporal scales and so if you don't have this kind of situation in the right scales then you're going to make a mess. And I think the concern is, is that, that the, the local element is lost. And of course, the government is committed to having metrics for biodiversity that will be legally enforceable. And as you say, it is a real challenge to, to uh, think what they may be, but an exciting challenge. OK, I'm going to go over to some questions now. And um, the first one is from Joshua Jones. And uh, I'm just going to read it out. If habitat disturbance can increase the risk of spillover effects, does this increase risk in the creation of novel habitats, e.g. green cities, riparian reserves, given these habitats are, are usually less biodiverse than primary forests and grasslands? Well, OK, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so, I mean, I guess the 
first thing to say is that we don't necessarily um, would we wouldn't necessarily expect symmetry in terms of going from pristine down through degraded down to the kind of nothing much there and then going back up through restoration or through creation of new ecosystems like riparian habitats or urban areas so so i wouldn't necessarily i would in fact i wouldn't expect the same processes necessarily to be op op operating on both sides um i think it's a it's a really interesting question that i'm not sure that anyone has looked at how would you would disease risk increase if you um restored an area or if you put an urban habitat in i mean my gut feeling it is is that it would decrease it but um i think that's something that is a whole ripe area that uh for research um, I, I think one area where people have thought about this is in terms of uh, vector-borne diseases mm -hmm. because yeah. especially some of the things you would like to do to have greener cities uh, might lead to increasing uh, mosquito populations and this is something that we may even need to think about in the UK uh, at the moment we're spared from from vector-borne diseases even though malaria was once uh, if one goes back to the middle ages was quite common here but there are risks with emergent arbovirus diseases, West Nile virus, uh, um, West Nile fever, for example, in, uh, which is in the States. So it may be something that we need to um, have to consider even in the UK. One of my favorite parts of London is the Barnes Wildlife Center, where one can see some real interesting biodiversity in the middle of the city. And if it suddenly turned out that it was breeding mosquitoes that could, that could transmit diseases, it would alter the dynamics of whether one wanted to put that in in the middle of a city. I think it's interesting though isn't it because um, there you've got an interaction with climate change so you've got an inter interaction of environmental disturbance um, whatever the humans are doing to the biodiversity plus climate change which is then making some of the vector-borne diseases more likely to come in some of the vectors more likely to come in um, but then you also have the the question of whether increasing biological diversity dilutes the disease or whether there's other what are the processes by which um, some of these vector borne diseases actually um, get into the correct host the ones that can then move on into humans so um, I think there's there's an awful lot more research that could be done isn't there in, into these complex interactions in a changing um, environment. Um, there's a, a question from Rosanna Lata which has three votes which sort of touches on this question that we've talked about a bit and um, Point out there are obviously roles for government and policy, but is anything we can do as individuals in the UK to help prevent future spillover events? And again, we are blessed in the UK by not having that many wildlife diseases. I suppose we have Lyme disease and things like that. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess, I think a really good question. And, and I kind of know that, well, you know, myself as an individual, not as a professional and, and people around, it's very hard not to get a bit despondent and a bit panicked by the kind of bad news that's coming from climate change and biodiversity and thinking, what what can I do? Um, and I think what COVID has taught us, if nothing else, is that spillover events in somewhere like uh, Yunnan province in China, just for example, could have a major effect on you comfortably sitting in Oxford um and so um you know in this age of globalization um things that we can do here to reduce the risk of spillover effects other in other parts of the world can be effective so you know talking like i had did before about supply chains so you know huge uh destruction of nature is to do with our agricultural supply chains and those agricultural supply chains the large majority of that uh, the damage that's being done is uh, livestock feed um, for meat which is then potentially ending up on our plates so you know if we could try to pressure government supermarkets um, to have more transparent supply chains and supply chains that um, don't lead to the destruction of natural habitats that will actually help us to protect ourselves against future pandemics potentially um, and I think, you know, plastics is a really nice example. It's getting a bit hackneyed now, but it's an example of where, um, you know, in order to make these big societal changes, you have to have um, public will. So the public needs to really want something to happen. You have to have the government political will and ability to legislate, and you have to have innovation in industry and business in order to be able to make those changes. So, you know, in the case of plastics, 
um, the social norm change, the public um, was prepared to have plastics, um, you know, to have that legislation put in place. The government was then able to put the legislation in place and we had innovation to shift us away. And that, that's happened on a number of occasions. And I think that's what we need. So as a member of the public, if you can think about your own consumption and if you can make noise, you can vote, you can um, vote the local council, but also nationally, you can, um, you know, make it clear that biodiversity matters to you, then it gives the space to governments and to industry to act. I, I find the whole thing about plastics absolutely fascinating, how it, it was almost a tipping point and the famous David Attenborough program obviously was the catalyst, but as you said, it, it was just ripe and ready to be pushed over the, uh, over the edge. Let me go to a question from Darren Evans. Uh, much of our discussion in academia about influence and science policy arena, but how should we engage with business, especially ESG and multi-capital uh, reporting, so that's environmental, social, and like you want governance uh, and uh, multi-capital re reporting. So that's thinking about natural capital as well as human and fi and financial capital. And I guess this is an th th there is a purist view again among some of the deeper green NGOs that any engagement with business sort of taints you and. Um, affects uh, affects a probity of what you're doing. I know you don't believe that. Um, how would you answer Darren's question? Um, well, of course we should engage in business because business, the, the major financial flows in this world um, come through business, you know, and we all depend upon business actually for our daily lives. So we can't just um, ignore multinationals. And, and, you know, there are, there are signs of multinationals actually wanting to um, to do better for biodiversity. And often, you know, one might be cynical, but I like to try to start by not being cynical and then be cynical when the evidence suggests I should be. But, you know, for me, um, there's a genuine issue of not really knowing what to do. You know, that climate change, carbon accounting is, is, is became, becoming more and more feasible. But biodiversity accounting is really, really hard. And, and there is at the moment no way for a company, a government, an organisation of any kind to be able to say, OK, here is my biodiversity impact on a metric that's kind of fungible, a metric that's actually where you can add up all the different impacts that you might have direct and indirect and say, this is the impact of me as an organisation. And then say, how would I go about reducing that impact or even making it so that it was um, net zero? Um, and a lot of that problem, some of that problem is just about supply chain traceability. So governments, so companies not really knowing where their stuff comes from. And that isn't really defensible going forward because nowadays we can trace, we just need to do it. But it's it's more about converting activities in a particular place into biodiversity impact. Bearing in mind what I said before about biodiversity being complicated, about the impacts being both direct on the ground and indirect. So for example, when um, you know, when you build a something, a mine or something in an area, you could have a direct footprint impact of what you've done, but you have all these indirect impacts because you have people coming in to work who are then consuming more, you have more water being used that then extracts water, you may have pollution going into the water, you may have people hunting more bushmeat, you may, you know, so all these indirect impacts come through and they, they affect biodiversity beyond the footprint. And so, um, it is complicated, but I think we just, I mean, one thing that Georgina, coming back to Georgina again, you know, one thing Georgina taught me at very, very early stage in my career was when we were doing the red list together, because we know that things are complicated, um, but that should never preclude you trying to get an answer. Of course, you don't want an answer that's, um, that's wrong. You, you don't want an answer that's actually misleading, but unless you kind of bite the bullet and try to produce something that will give you an approximation to the to the core of the answer you're not going to get better and you're not going to actually be able to drive change so it's much better to be robustly slightly wrong or slightly scruffy mm. in what you're doing than um wait for perfection i think as scientists we always try to move towards perfection so so maybe a little bit more um rough and ready just so that we can get started with this i i, I think one other thing that sort of encourages me is that 
um, considerations of the environment within the private sector are beginning to move out of what is sometimes called the ESG ghetto and are becoming more mainstream. And we see a big consortium of uh, uh, American companies coming together to say, how can they actually act in a world where the environment is, is threatened? And I think if you look at, I'm going to make a parochial Oxford point here, but some of the writings of some of our economists, such as uh, Colin Meyer and Paul Collier, who are talking about the nature and purpose in, build, in business, and the fact that what we conceive of a business purpose today is actually quite a narrow modern construct of the last 20 or 30 years. And if one takes a sort of longer view of what the nature of a business is, thinking about multi-stakeholders, not just shareholders, thinking about the people who work for it, and that many of the people who work for companies care deeply about what their companies do. I do think see things there that are potentially um, optimistic. I agree, and I think you know CEOs are people, and um, we—that's one reason to, to just be a little bit wary about going too far down the line of um, economic valuation and natural capital, and think more about contributions. Because if you if you narrowly think about impacts and dependencies in financial terms, then you miss a whole lot of the stewardship stuff, and you actually miss opportunities for long-term sustainability for companies. And I think they are realizing that. Um, I'm going to move to a question from Andrew Farlow. It's quite a long question, and Andrew, forgive me, I'm going to paraphrase it a bit and concentrate on the on the second bit, which um, there's a lot of talk about building back better after the pandemic at the moment. Andrew talks about, can you articulate a recovery plan that protects the natural world? Um, EJ, what do you take by the meaning of building back better and how would you like to see that actually implemented? So what it's not is trying as fast as we can to get back to the economic trajectory we were already on because, you know, all the um, IPP, IPCC scenarios, all the um, it, best scenarios, all the scenarios by international organisations of biodiversity and climate change specialists who talk through the different ways in which our economy as a world might progress. All those scenarios show that we're on the wrong trajectory at the moment. So, so we can't just try to bounce our economies back as quickly as we can. We have to do something more like what Germany is thinking to do, which is um, there are opportunities to invest in a green economy. Um, and those opportunities are, are multifarious. And that requires us to think through um which of the changes that we have had to make we should keep so things like um perhaps more home working more localism in that in our purchasing um those kinds of things are things that um can form the basis of a of a build back better kind of economy and like i said we already have the innovation so if we if we can actually support some of the innovations in energy in um for example then we can actually um move perhaps into a sustainable trajectory um EJ, i want to try and fit in two questions now to finish off with and i mention this because uh, I know you're fascinated by the next next question and could talk about it for a very long time. And it's a question <laughs> from um, what is China's role of tackling global illegal, illegal wildlife trade? And what's the possible effect of its Belt and Road Scheme, which I know you've been thinking about? Can you say a few words about that? And then I want to fit in one last question. OK, I'll try and be quick. Um, China has a pivotal role. Um, and they're actually making the right noises about both illegal wildlife trade and actually sustainable green economies. Um, so I think on that front, engagement with China is a, is a useful thing. In terms of the Belt and Road, um, there's huge potential dangers there and there's huge potential opportunities. And I think one of the things that we're trying to think about in our group is how do you, how do you equip the governments of the countries through which the Belt and Road is going to pass to have the appropriate environmental legislation and the appropriate compliance um, that when the infrastructure comes, it comes in a way that's ecologically sensible, it comes in a way that, um, like I was talking before, means that um, you have space for nature, you might even be able to restore nature as a result of that infrastructure and you might be able to move towards sustainable use of some of these wildlife products and not immediate just kind of 
depredation. And I think, you know, even if you're thinking about something like Chinese traditional medicine, the Chinese traditional medicine uh, practitioner organizations are interested in sustainable use of traditional medicine. And you just need to build that together with um, making sure that the Belt and Road is not just going to lead to lowest common denominator profit driven extraction. So it's, it's a real challenge and opportunity. So the last question relates to something we were talking about just before we came on air. And it's from a good friend of the school, Jaron Larajani. Um, do you think that positive messaging about how conservation and restora restoration can help us will be sufficient to counter the we are near the end feeling going around? So what we were talking about, the just general feeling of gloom and despondency at the moment. <laughs> Well, it has to be, doesn't it? <laughs> because you end up with a self-fulfilling prophecy otherwise. So, you know, if if we all just sit there disempowered and depressed about being near the end, then 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 we will be. So, you know, a lot of what I try to do in, in my work is, is to um, showcase places where things have worked, showcase people who are doing amazing things for nature and think about ways that we can scale that up and think about ways that we can get those kinds of positive stories into the mainstream. I think, you know, governments, businesses, individuals don't bat losers. So if we in conservation are serious about getting into the public discourse, we have to do it in a way that thinks towards solutions rather than just focusing on the dire state we're in. So uh, within the UK, then we have screened on BBC television the a programme by David Attenborough um, on extinction. Um, just an extremely gloomy picture. And of course, a classic David Attenborough has been just showing the, the natural world without talking about the threats to it. Uh, and so it's a bit of a shock to see an Attenborough programme going almost completely to the other direction. What is your view about the the balance that one should have between talking about doom and gloom and then talking about the positive side? It's, it's a question that I have no answer to. No, I mean, you have to acknowledge the state we're in. So, you know, you can't just sit there thinking, oh, well, we're going to sort this out, it's fine. Um, you have to acknowledge the urgency. And I think it's difficult as conservation at the moment because we are in this point of, you know, maybe we are in the last chance saloon a little bit, a lot, actually. Um, but we also have opportunities to get out of it. And although the window is closing, the window is not closed. And so, you know, although it was really, really hard to sit through 15 minutes of that David Attenborough documentary, if you made it to the last eight minutes, there were very clear messages about the way forward. And coming out of a load of the NGOs now and out of these data things are clear messages. Um, and we just have to assimilate those and find ways as a society, as individuals, to move towards those um, solutions because they are there. I'm afraid we are virtually at the end of our hour. Um, let me apologise to the people who pose questions and that I wasn't able to get to. There's some really good questions there. Um, our next talk is um, with Mariana Mazzucato, the wonderful UCL economist who has written a series of fascinating books. And it will be a discussion about the big failure of small government, COVID-19 and public sector capacity. Uh, it's not to be missed. She's just the most fabulous uh, speaker. And that will be at the 13th of Oct on the 13th of October at 5 p.m. So please do um, register and join us for that. Um, EJ, thank you so much for joining me uh, this evening. It's been a really fascinating talk. You've talked about many of the challenges looking ahead for conservation. You're one of the people who make me feel optimistic. So keep on doing the wonderful work that you're doing. And finally, thank you for everyone who's joined us uh, this evening to listen to EJ. Goodbye. Thank you.